thrilled to be here. Uh, I tell you what, every time I come, uh, I, I just always am expecting a remodel. Um, I don't know what y'all doing down here watching a lot of HGTV. I don't know what's going on, but every time I come, you guys have done something incredible to the building. And that is a testament to the growth that's happening, to what the Spirit of the Lord does. I believe that's a tangible, evident um, moving of what God is doing in this house, right? Every time I come, there's something new, there's something fresh, and there's something that has been prepared for people. Amen? And so I'm excited about what you guys have done. It looks amazing. Are y'all happy to have that back there? Yeah. It looks great. I know you're like, Lisa, you got all that out of a couple of risers and a new camera? Yes, absolutely. When the Lord is blessing, you, you look for it, man. We, I, listen, I bid you peace and grace from my pastors, uh, Pastors Daryl and Donna Allen, where I'm covered uh, at a central church. Uh, I serve as a staff pastor there on top of flying around the country and ministering and all that good stuff and uh, do a lot of different things. But this morning, this is the business at hand. And this is where I'm privileged to stand in this house in America's Georgia with you. And I'm excited about that. To our online audience this morning, we want to say welcome. I'm excited that you're here. Listen, you tuned in. If you're, if you're scrolling on your phone right now or you're catching this on YouTube or something like that, you have hit, just stop, just hit it. Don't scroll. You found the word of the Lord for you today. And I believe it's going to bless your life. Amen. I am uh, I'm so excited also that I heard that pastor's getting his first tail light baby. I'm super excited about that. Y'all know what tail light babies are, right? You get them grandbabies and you love to see them come. But then you love to see them go. <laughs> when that tail light's hitting down the driveway, you're tired, right? So you're going to get your first tail light baby. I'm so excited. And Kayla, we just, from our family, we just say congratulations. I'm excited. I, I want you to know um, just between you and I, I was praying for you this morning. I remember that. Don't y'all remember that morning sickness, ladies? Oh, Jesus, I know every woman in here just turned green. We, our heart is with you today, honey. Our heart is with you, but congratulations. We're excited for you and Earl. Um, well, let's get right into it. I'm, I, was, I, told, I had told Pastor about the word that I'm bringing this morning, and whenever you're in the pulpit on a Sunday morning with an entire church, and it's Mother's Day, everybody's like, well... Let's go listen to our Proverbs 31 message. <laughs> it's going to be for the women. And then we're going to leave, and we're going to go get some flowers that are half off today at Kroger because I didn't get them last night. And then we're going to run over to Mom and Nims and probably eat us a little something and then get on back to the house. And that's Mother's Day, right? That's Mother's Day. I believe that today the Lord has something different for you. I believe that you're not waiting to get to Mom and Nims to eat. I believe that today that the Lord has set a table for us and we're about to eat that we're about to eat. And it won't be just for moms, right? It'll be for everyone in the house. There's a word for, if you came expecting a word today, you won't leave without one. You just won't. When we know that the Lord is not moved by need. He's moved by what? Faith, right? If you came in faith today and said, I got to have something and I ain't leaving until I get it, you're going to leave here today, Mark. You're going to leave here today changed. Amen? I'm excited. We're going to get right into the word. If you have your Bible, I hope that you do. You don't go to Walmart without your uh, debit card. I hope you didn't come to church without your Bible. <laughs> I'm going to let that sink in for a minute while I clean these glasses. <laughs> if you have your Bible, your phone, however you are looking at your word, however you're looking that up, I want you to go to Judges 4. We're going to be in Judges 4 and 5 today. And we are, is, do I have a timer right there? Amen. Okay. Because every mom in here, when I just said that, she went, well, now I did put that roast on now. It's on a timer. <laughs> So we're okay. So Judges, if you'll go to Judges with me. I love the book of Judges. Pastor, it's one of my favorites. I love the Old Testament. I just do. I love the Old Testament. Now, I love the New Testament. I, I do. I, I love where the law is fulfilled and Jesus comes, Kelsey, and, and he's the man on the scene and he's the, he's the hero. I, I love all that. But there's something so amazing and rich about the Old Testament. And I believe we're going to see something today that we haven't seen before. A lot of us know Judges 4 and 5. It's the story of Deborah. But it's not just the story of Deborah. There are so many other people that are involved in this, and it's not just about what Deborah has done. I believe that the Lord is about to show us something really that maybe we haven't seen before in this passage. I love Judges because in the book of Judges, there's this cycle that continues to happen. It's just over and over. And it's much like our life, right? To understand the book of Judges and the land of Canaan, you have to see the land of Canaan as your life, 
right? The land of Canaan is your life. And then the enemies of God, all the bad kings, right? That's the sin in our life. And we're always er trying to eradicate that, right? That's, that's what the book of Judges is, uh, is laid out, that this cycle of the people of God, the Israelites, <clears throat> they'll, they'll love God, and then they get really slack. Anybody say amen? <laughs> that, that ever been part of your testimony? And then you forget him for a minute, and then you get in some pain, and then you repent and cry out, and then he comes and saves us. Now, this is what happens in the book of Judges over and over. I mean, every chapter, it's like, and then the people were stupid. <laughs> it doesn't say that. That's the message version. But, <laughs> but it does allude to that. Then they left God, and, and they were crazy and, and went nuts for a while. So if you go to 4, we're going to see someone's name here, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you. This is during a time where they didn't have, Israel didn't have a king. Right? You know, there's King Saul, there's King David. We didn't have a king. That's not the, the time that we were in. Who was their king? God was their king, right? And so they had who ruled the nations for just and the, justice and, and, and all of that. And you got to have somebody that sorts some of that stuff out down here. God had raised up these uh, judges. These were judges in the lands. They were, uh, this was the era of prophets and judges. And that's who came down here and, and helped with all the people and all. But God was their king. And so you're fixing to hear, when you hear a judge, I want you to know, if you're not familiar with that, that this is a very high-ranking person, the highest in the land. It's who God from heaven speaks to, and they speak to the people and dispense justice, right? So that's how that works. And if you're new today, I know that um, Mother's Day typically is the second day only to Easter for new visitors in church and that sort of thing. So if you're here today and you say, you don't really know a lot about the Bible, I want you to know what I'm about to read, what we're about to talk about is a true story. This isn't, this isn't a book of inspiration. This isn't just a, um, something that was written about to inspire us. And this was, uh, this is history. This is real. When I say these names, Deborah, Barack, J.L., these are real people. This really happened. And sometimes I think we forget that. Sometimes I think we get so caught up. These are not fairy tales, and they're not fables. These are people's lives, right? And so that's what makes it all the more exciting. So now, let's go. So we're in Judges 4, and we got just a few verses, a little bit of reading to do. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. There we go. So the Lord sold them. Oh, what? The Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazar, the commander of his army was Sisera, who dealt, who, I'm sorry, who dwelt in Harish. And the children of Israel cried out, there's that repentance again, to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron and for 20 years had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Now Deborah, look at your neighbor and say, now Deborah. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up for judgment. Then she sat and called for Barak, her son, the son of Abedim from Kadesh, and said to him, Has not the Lord of God Israel commanded Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun. And against you, I will deploy Sisera. I will get him to come down, she's telling him. The commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude at the river of Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand. And Barak said to her, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go, I will not go. So she said to him, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey that you're taking. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now, what, let's, let's get into this. What just happened here? So to know what's just happening here, you got to know a little bit about Deborah. Um, Deborah is... Uh, Deborah's a bad girl, y'all. <laughs> this chick is a bad girl. I love her. Um, Deborah is a, a lot of things. When I, this is the anointing that I pray for, ladies. This is the anointing that I pray for. This is the one I want. 
pastor fight. This is, Deborah has an, when you have a Deborah anointing, you do many things. You have a lot of roles. You have a lot of responsibilities, right? So there's a hat where I'm, I'm a pastor in East Atlanta. Then I'm a, a minister on the road. And then I'm a wife, and I'm a mom, and I also, y'all know I sling some jokes and sell some hope. I do some comedy, you know what I mean? Like, I got a lot of things going on over here, okay? Um, and I want, it, I want the oil, the anointing of God on each one of those. And so that's what Deborah had. Deborah was many things. We're going to talk about that. Let's see, what, what all was Deborah? Deborah was a wife. We know that from Scripture, wife of Labadoth. She was a judge. She was the only female judge, the only one. She led for 60 years. That's a long time. That is a long, for real, like anybody got a 60-year career in here? That's a long time. So 60 years she led. Um, her first 20 is under this oppression and serious, serious, terrible oppression. So it's not like she had it all gravy. Um, all of Israel is under her jurisdiction. Not just a piece of it. All of a nation is under her jurisdiction. Right, so under the palm tree, she dispenses, they, she sits there, and she dispenses righteousness, justice, and mercy all day long. That's what she does. People come to her. They just, where have we seen this before in Scripture? We've seen this from Moses. We've seen this with the people where he would sit and he would do that, right? And so that's, that's the model that we have here in the Old Testament. Um, the palm tree, everybody talks about the palm of Deborah. That's where she sat under. And why is that a big deal? It's because palms were really, really rare in Palestine. They were rare. They were a thing of beauty. And so she gets her own tree. I was like, darn, girl. You talking about making a mark. <laughs> you get your own tree. Um, in rabbinic, uh, rabbinic uh, tradition, it maintains that, that that validated her fairness and openness and her refusal to show partiality. Um, there's, she's a prophetess. Now, some of us get caught up with that word because in today's culture, in church culture, everybody's a prophetess. Everybody is. Everybody hearing from God. Everybody, you know what I'm saying? Everybody got a word for you, right? We got parking lot prophets. You know what I mean? Like, follow you out to the car. Um, but, but really, what a prophet and a prophetess is, is they, they discern the mind of God. Right? They discern the mind. They have the ability to discern the mind of God and the purpose of God and declare it to others. So God will speak something to them from his mind to their mind and then into their spirit, and they will speak it to other people, and it's, and it's from God. Right? And so that's what, that's what that means. It also means that she knew the word. She knew the word of God, and she taught the word of God. She didn't, she didn't keep it to herself. She knew it, and she taught it. Y'all, this is all going to be important in just a minute. <laughs> So, um, there were only about seven prophetesses in the entire Old Testament. The Old Testament's long. Did y'all know that? It's kind of long. It's got a lot of years in there. There's only seven prophetesses. That's amazing, and Deborah's one of them. She was a military leader. I told y'all, she's a bad girl. She's a military leader. She's a patriot. She's a warrior. This is who she is. Um, like Moses before her and David after her, she refused her she fused herself in the roles of prophet, national leader, and military commander. You know how our president is the commander in chief, right? That's that's who he is. He's he that's the same for here. She does that for an entire nation herself as a woman. Um she's a poetess, she's a songwriter, she's a minstrel, she's a musician, right? How do we know that? This is why it's important to know Judges four and five. Four, Judges 4, if you ever read those together, you're like, it's kind of weird. They're kind of talking about the same thing. They kind of repeat some stuff, but they add some stuff. I'm going to tell you why. Judges 4 are the events, and Judges 5 is the explanation. And Judges 5 is actually a song. It's a hymn. That's why it has more descriptions in it, and it's really cool, and it fills in all the gaps from 4 that we didn't really get a piece of. And so it's a song that she wrote for her and Barak, to sing as a duet, right? And so, um, so she, she's creative. There, she's a counselor. People had problems for her to solve, and the Bible records that the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. One, uh, one of the first counseling ministries in the Bible. One of the first, I mean, what is that? That's exactly what we do, right, in ministry. When people come to us with their problems, we help them sort it out. We, 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 we pray. We, we try to hear the Lord. We, she's doing this all day long. So she has this counseling ministry. Um, she's the only judge that does not go out to preach. They come to her. They line up. She's the only one in the Old Testament. They, they line up and wait 
to get to the palm so that they can hear her, hear her wisdom from the Lord. Now she's also a mother, right? The, the Bible says in Judges 5, which I love this. Um, in Judges 5, if you get to verse 7, it says, Village life ceased. This is when they're being oppressed. Village life ceased, and it ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel. Now, we don't know if Deborah had children. The, the Bible never says. We, we never really get to know that. Um, but there's no other heroine like Deborah in the Hebrew Bible, none. She is called a mother in Israel, probably one of the highest designations in Scripture as it indicates authority. Maybe it was because she was also a biological mother. We don't know, like I said. This would be important showing that mothers can attain um, political prominence, right? That would be important for us to know if she was or not, but we can, we can just have to, to guess there. But more likely this phrase indicates that her arbitration powers as a judge were parental, even maternal. You know, we're talking about Kayla and, and her, having, um, her having a baby, and so I'm going to use her for a minute. Um, Kayla is, is, in a few months, is about to watch, or any new mom that's in here is about to watch your heart come out of your body and walk around your t outside, right? That's what happens when you're a mom. You watch your heart come out of your body and walk around. <laughs> you love that child more than anything. You, you, you find a piece of you, um, a depth of you, um, a discerning of you, a nurturing in you that you could ne you don't, you've never known before. And because of that, there's something within a mother that causes us to be able to lead and be impartial, to have mercy. There's just another level of that in a mother. I didn't make the rules. I'm just reporting the news here, okay? <coughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't make that up. <coughs> Excuse me. That's just something that, that's by design in a woman. Y'all going to have to forgive me these allergies. The devil is a lie. Um, and I don't have anything that's contagious unless you want a Benadryl. Um, and I know that because I did have, uh, um, some of you know, when I was here in January, right after I left y'all, I, um, I, I went home and ended up actually having COVID, not from here, of course, but several weeks later. <coughs> and um, so I just say, I know what that feels like, and this ain't that. Uh, <laughs> but, but I'm on some inhaler and some different things this morning, so everybody rest easy. Don't nobody tense up on me now. Um, but so it, there's a mater this maternal, there's just this maternal thing in you that, that awakens, right? And so she is judging Israel through that lens, through that lens where she can be impartial, she can have mercy, she can do exactly what God wants her to do. So in this time, we see she's doing all this. Now we know what Deborah does. What is she doing? And she's doing it in a time where they're so oppressed. This is what's happening. So King Jabin is the bad guy. Let's just paraphrase this. King Jabin is the bad guy, and he's got this hitman, Sisera, right? And Sisera's rough, y'all. I mean, there's, I wouldn't even explain. We have some young children in here. There's things I can't even tell you about his reign and rule that would be appropriate for me to even share in church. It's horrible what he does to women and children what he does to villagers. And so when it says village life has ceased, they really mean that. So at first it just began, began where King Jabin was oppressing them, and they couldn't get down the highways and byways, right? They just couldn't get down the major roads, and, and that would drive them to their villages, and so they couldn't travel. Well, then what begins to happen is it gets so bad that, that they have to leave their own village, so all the villagers go to these four to big fortified cities that are walled up, and they begin to live there in caves or wherever they can go to hide out. And so all their villages are left in ruins. Can you imagine your whole neighborhood, your whole subdivision? It, it just, just think about it that way. Where your whole neighborhood, you, everybody just got up and left in fear, right? And what would happen to that neighborhood? It would turn to ruin, because nobody would live there. That's what, that's what this village life is they're talking about. That, why is that? Because the people of Israel are paying a high price for what's called apostasy. They've turned to idolatry. And the Lord, when, when I read you that earlier, it said the Lord sold them into the hand of this bad king and that they would have this oppression. It's really the grace of God because he's trying to drive them back to him, right? It's really the grace of God. Sometimes we end up in some bad places, I've ended up in some bad places. Come on, somebody. 
where I turned around and went, I can't believe, how did I get here? How did I get here? And then when I cried out to the Lord and I got out of that, right, and the Lord came and had mercy on my life, I realized it was the greatest thing that happened to me. It was the grace of God that let me get on down in there until I found out I needed him, right? That's what's happening to Israel right here. Um, there's something very interesting about Deborah. Now, this is where we're going to get into a little bit of meat right here. Something very interesting about Deborah. For all that she is, there's a quality that she has that's above reproach. Women, there's something that she has, and it's not any of the roles I just listed to you. They show it and they exemplify it, but there's something she has that is above reproach. And it's how she relates appropriately to authority. She is a woman. That is not lost on me. That is not lost on you. And that is certainly not lost on the Old Testament. She relates appropriately to authority. And I believe that there is a direct correlation between the anointing on her life and this principle right here. How do we know that? Verse 4, it says she is listed as the wife of Labadoth. Men are not listed as the husband of a woman. <laughs> They're not, okay? That's not happening in the Old Testament, right? So we know that she is in order. Let me just tell you all this, a little sidebar here. I am the wife of one Richie Mills. I am the wife of one Richie Mills, right? I love that title. You're not going to have me up in no kind of feminism that's ever going to make me deny that. You're not ever going to have me deceived into thinking that, that that makes me any less because I carry the title that I am Richie Mills' wife. I am Miss Lisa Mills. I am honored by that. That's a bad dude right there. You hear me? <laughs> he is fine and he is mine. Can you get amen? Yes. Like, I, I, am, I, I know that I am proud of him. I am proud to be his wife. She was the same way. Verse 5, I love this. Barak is the first, what we call the first of my equals. Are y'all okay? We're doing a little bit of teaching this morning. Is that all right? <coughs> Barak is the first of my equals. Barak is this general that Deborah gets this download. Deborah, Deborah gets this download from God, y'all, from God about, a, about Barak. And she goes to Barak, we read, she goes to Barak and, and she calls him up about this whole battle plan. God has downloaded this battle strategy and how we're going to get free from King Jabin, how we can defeat him, how we can get free. And so she calls this general. Some people, you know, there's all kind of, is he a judge, is he not a judge? We're not, we're not here to decide that today. But we do know he's a general and we do know that Deborah got a download for him from heaven. So Barak is called the first among equals in the Bible. That is not because he's, like in, if you go to Hebrews in that hall of faith, in that hall of faith, they'll list him first. And people say, well, you know, they list Barak first. Why don't they list Deborah? She was the one who, whatever. It's because when you're first among equals, it doesn't mean that you're bigger or higher or whatever. They just list you because it would take forever. Paul does that in the, Old Testament, in the New Testament. It would take forever to list everybody that's associated with. So they just list one. So many people, if you, um, if people want to say who, who was more, had more weight, who had more victory in this or whatever, that's not, we're, that's not even the point today. We're not even really talking about gender roles. We're talking about how people work together. <clears throat> so she, um, so Barack is, is the first among equals, and we know that Deborah understands her place with him, right, is to work with him. Um, she also writes chapter 5, I told y'all that, it's a duet, she wrote it, but it, she wrote it as a duet. Her and Barack are singing this together. She's sharing this, ex, this entire experience and battle and victory and all that with him. Right? She's not trying to keep that for herself. She, this is the best part, y'all. Wives, listen up. And the husbands will amen in a minute. But wives, listen up. <laughs> right here, I love this part. She does not correct Barack. We teach that a lot of times like she corrects him, like she shames him, like she goes to him and says, didn't the Lord tell you? That's not what she says to him. She doesn't. She challenges him by asking him a question because she is a prophetess. God gave her the download. What does a prophet do when they come and give you a word? They should confirm what God has spoken to you. 
It needs to confirm something in you. It shouldn't be way out of left field. It shouldn't be, you know, you're going to move to Africa and be a missionary. You know what I mean? And that's never been in your heart. And that's never anything you've sought for the Lord. Or you're going to, you know, go back to college and be a doctor. And, and you can't even stand blood. And you're like, that's the last thing I ever want to do. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing that resounds in your spirit or your heart for that. There should be something that would connect. It, it's, it confirms why do I say that? Because now we know when we understand that, that the Lord had already told Barak. The Lord had already told him. And so she calls him not to shame him and correct him. She calls him to pull on that word. She calls him to challenge him and to confirm it within him. Yes, you did hear. Did you not hear? Did you not hear? Did the Lord not say? So she doesn't correct him. She just challenges and confirms him. What does that mean? She doesn't call him out. She calls him up. And as people of God and as leaders, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, that's what we are called to do. We are not here to call people out. We're here to call people up, right? That's the mandate that's on our lives as leaders, and that's the anointing that we want uh, in our homes, right? Amen? You want that in your home. I want that for my children. I've missed the mark on that a million times. I'm going to tell you, I've told you all this before. It, listen, Hold on. If you got some young kids, just keep on living because you're going to say things in a Walmart parking lot through some gritted teeth you never thought you'd say. <laughs> I promise you, it, sometimes you have to look around and see there's a camera out in the parking lot. You know, you'd be like, God, I hope nobody saw that. I hope nobody heard me, you know, because I'm telling you, it is hard to lead. It's hard to lead out of this uh, when you're leading people, whether it's your home or your church or your job or wherever, because why? People are people. People are frustrated. <laughs> People will frustrate you, right? Absolutely. And so that's why we have to draw on the Lord. In our own strength, we can't do it. You can't lead nobody under your own strength. You've got to have the Holy Ghost, honey. You gotta have the Holy Ghost to be married. You gotta have the Holy Ghost to be some have some kids. You gotta have listen, I gotta have the Holy Ghost to go to Dollar General. I got listen, I can't go nowhere without him. If I, you know how you get up and you just get going, you know, and, if, and, and my husband will tell you, if I didn't take time for some uh, Jesus, if I ain't been in worship and I ain't been in prayer, don't you let me hit that door. I better not be leaving K-Circle. Uh-uh. It will not be good. Some, somebody's car is getting keyed. Um, oh, man, I wish that wasn't true. Um, but Lapidoth, let's talk about him for a minute. Let's see, there's a lot of characters in this. And we want to we extract from each one before we close this thing out right here in a few minutes. We want to extract what God is saying to us through each person. Because it's not just Deborah's story. We go to Judges 4 and 5 and we're like, oh, this is Deborah's story. This is the heroine. This is the mother's day. But uh-uh. It's really isn't about Deborah's story. Lapidoth is her husband. Now, this is what I love about him. Because one of the things I love about my husband. Labadoth commended and cultivated his wife so much she could flourish. We hear his name. We don't hear a lot about him. But what kind of a secure man, what kind of a gifted, talented, righteous man he must have been for Deborah to lead a nation. Would, he ha would the Lord have given her a husband who was weak or anything like that to a leader of a nation that he expected to dispense righteousness, justice, and mercy? No, he would not. He would have given her everything possible to flourish, including the man that she married. So we know this man is amazing. And he gives her this, he, he cultivates her, y'all. He gives her this atmosphere. He gives her this space. He gives her this everything that she needs to do this amazing job that God has called her to do. Everybody says, well, you know, when, when, you're, when you're growing up and, and you, for all you young people in here, well, I want a Proverbs 31 woman. Well, let me tell you a secret. That girl's got a Proverbs 31 husband. Read Proverbs 31. What does it say? I love it. Her husband is known in the gates, and when he sits among the elders of the land. That's in Proverbs 31, guys. That, that chick's got a bad husband. Come on now. Like, she's, she's, a, she's an awesome woman. It's because she has an awesome husband. 
And I know that kind of lands a little bit maybe on some young women, and you're like, I can be awesome without an awesome husband. Yes, you can, honey. Absolutely. But if you're going to be married, if you get to pick it, baby, <laughs> you better pick you somebody that's in line with the will of God for your life. You better choose wisely. This thing, when you choose a husband, it's so little about love. Love is like probably a distant third. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong if you've been married a long time. Love is distant third. That man better be able to feed you. <laughs> I get hungry. <laughs> Listen, I'm used to the finer things in life, like Georgia Power. <laughs> Have me hauling water. This ain't little house on the prairie. You better be working. <laughs> And come on, man, it don't work, don't eat. I love how, you know, that doesn't say his wife don't eat. That girl going to find something, right? <laughs> Just the man don't eat. <laughs> but if you get to choose, you got you to gotta pick wisely. And not just for things that you need to sustain your life here on earth, but to sustain your life in the kingdom. Right? Deborah had, Deborah had a kingdom purpose. You have a kingdom purpose. You, I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you've been saved five minutes. I don't care if you're sitting in this room and you're not saved. You have a purpose. God has one marked out for your life, man. Right? And whoever you bring to your life, whoever you attach to your life, they are now part of that, right? And they're going to affect that, okay? So her husband is giving her this. He's cultivating her and allowing her to flourish, um, which I, I just love. Now let's talk about the next one, Barak. Okay, that was Labadoth is her husband, Barak is her general. Labadoth, um, y'all, here in, the, in this story, I'm sorry, Barak, in this story we get to see Barak. Barak is the temptation of every man. Now, this is only where I'm stepping on toes for a hot minute, so fellas, bear with me, okay? But we got to have some truth, okay? And I want you to hear it in love. I realize it's coming from a woman, and I'm in rural Georgia. In a pulpit on Sunday. Blessed be the Lord. Come on. It's all right. As my husband says, it'll be all right when it dries. <laughs> but he's the temptation of every man. And it's cowardly disobedience. It's the temptation of every, and every woman. It's the temptation of humanity. Cowardly disobedience. Why? Because it's easier to avoid responsibility and to abandon what we need to do. It's just it's our nature. It's our carnal nature. It's just easier. I, you know, you hear men say, we're going to start tithing when? When I get this raised, baby, we're going to start tithing. When we're going to start praying. You know, we get in the new house, every night we're going to have devotion. We're going to do it then. I promise we are. We are. We're going to start praying together. You know what? Uh, we're going to start praying together. The next time we ever get in a tight spot like this, I think at night before we go to bed, we're going to pray over each other. We'll do it then. It's our nature to put things off. It's our nature to shift the responsibility and try to abandon what we know we should do. It's what feels good to our flesh, right? This thing ain't easy, y'all. I don't know who ever sold somebody coming into the kingdom that this was a cakewalk and it was amazing uh, because it was easy. It ain't amazing because it's easy. It's amazing because it's worth it. it, it, ain't, it ain't, this ain't never been easy. <laughs> this ain't never been easy. There's some things that we have to do. It's work. That's why we call it kingdom work. <laughs> we don't call it kingdom vacation. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? That'd be great. And it's like, what do you do? I, I do kingdom vacation for a living. Uh, <laughs> but we don't. We do kingdom work, right? So um, it's, our, it's our propensity to want to avoid and, and abandon responsibility. You know, a lot of times in a, in, a, in, a, in a man's mind, he will think, and I say this because, men, I'm, I'm addressing you as the leader of a home, as the priest of a home, as the pastor of your residence, of your family, Right? So we say, well, you know, it's, it's the women. They raise the kids. My wife's supposed to raise the kids. The teachers, they're supposed to educate them. The youth pastor's supposed to disciple them. No. You are. You are. That's your job, right? I don't care if you're married to a Deborah. That's still your job. If, you, if you're married to a Deborah, if you're married to a Proverbs 31, and I bet you are, but that's your job to pastor your family. 
And when we know that that Barak is that 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 thing is in us, like it was in Barak, to to be fully capable, right? He was fully capable, fully talented in war, fully every he was ordained by God to do it, and he still didn't want to, and he wanted to depend on Deborah. Now, Deborah doesn't go down to fight in the battle. She doesn't actually pick up a sword. So why was that going to help him? What, what was that going to matter? It's because Deborah was going to be, and it's what she does, is she's up on the mountain of Mount Tabor as they're battling, and the enemy sees her, and they know who she is. She is the authority of God Almighty, and that is intimidating to them. And it is also strengthening to the people of Israel that are fighting. And Barak knew that. He did not know who he was in his own self and his relationship with the Lord and what God had called him to do, that he could do it by himself. And he wanted to depend on her standing there and people seeing that. He wanted them to have faith in that instead of him having faith in what the Lord had given him to do. Every man struggles with that. Every man Brock is a beautiful illustration, though, I love this, of God using a person to lead despite their flaws. Don't you love that? Again, we see the mercy and grace of God played out in his life. Like, like man, I've messed this thing up, and God will still let me lead. You've blown it. I know you have because you're sitting in here. We've all blown it at one time or another, and God will still use us mightily. Isn't that incredible? It's incredible. Um, Hebrews eleven thirty three. 33, when I talk about the Hall of Faith, when they mention Barak, this is the most beautiful thing that's mentioned about him. Y'all, the grace of God is incredible. It says, whose weakness was turned to strength. Whose weakness was turned to strength. Look what God does for him in the end, right? He honors him in the end in the Hall of Faith this way. So amazing. I love it. You know, um, dads, just so that you know, when a child comes to faith in Christ... For the rest of the family to come on, when a child comes first, there's a 3% chance that the rest of the family will come. Three. Thank God for kids who come to those VBSs and buses pick them up and all that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that. When a mom comes and she comes to faith in Christ, there's a 17% chance that the whole family will come and be saved. 17. Honey, I've seen a lot of mamas sitting on a pew by herself year after year. God be with her. Yes, absolutely. The strength of that. Just praying and believing and calling her family in, Pastor. Yeah, 17%. But when a dad, when a dad comes to faith in Christ, you know what percentage of the family comes to faith in Christ as a sold-out family of believers in the Lord Jesus? 93%. Dad. Husbands, men, pastor your home. Give your wife what she needs to flourish. Give your children the example that that they need. Amen? That's what we can learn from Barak. Now, Sisera was the enemy. We're we're on the downhill slope, y'all. Sisera was her enemy. And like I said, he was Jabin's main guy. He was this evil hitman. We're going to go to, um, we have two, these two new characters about, or uh, there's a new character about to enter the story as we close it out. And, um, well, let's just read and let's see what happens to her. So we're going to read uh, Judges 14 and 17. Let's see what happens. However, Sisera, remember this is, the, this is the bad guy, had fled away on foot. Now they're in the battle. Barak, remember, Deborah's up on the mountain and Barak's down there and they're all fighting. And Sisera, the main general guy who's super, super evil, they're all fighting. Now they're starting to lose. The bad guys are starting to lose terribly. There's this whole thing that the Lord does for them. He confuses them. There's some rain that comes. It's all this stuff. Um, but Sisera, now who's the coward? He gets out of the chariot. Remember, they had all these 900 chariots. He gets out of the chariot, and he runs. He runs to a nearby place and leaves his men because they're all dying. All right? Evil is a coward, by the way. (laughs) And A bully is a coward, really. Um, So that's what's happening to him. He's fleeing, and he comes to... um, This place is about 10 miles away. There's There's this little village, little tent pitched or whatever, and uh, there's a guy named Heber. 
Now, Heber is actually a descendant of Moses' father, Jethro. Y'all remember Prince of Egypt? Come on, I know you probably don't remember the Old Testament. But everybody saw Prince of Egypt. Y'all know that cartoon if you got kids. Y'all remember Jethro? Come on. Y'all remember the little wedding and the whale and all that, yeah? Okay, so Jethro, he has some descendants. And that's where Jael and Heber come from that we're about to talk about, this man and wife. Now, Heber and Jael, they don't worship God despite being from Moses' family. <laughs> they, don't, they don't worship the Lord. They're not God-fearing people or whatever. And they move over um, out of their village kind of halfway to the bad kings so they can be closer to him. Why? Because they worked in metal. They're iron workers. They're metal workers, coppersmiths. And see, this bad king had all these chariots, right? He had all these chariots. So Heber's like, he's an opportunist. If you had a mechanic, if you were a mechanic, where would you move? Someone, a town that had a lot of cars that need fixing, right? So he moves over there. He's just a hustler, right? Heber's got, he's hustling games. He's like, listen, I don't care. I don't care if he's a bad king. We got peace. We're at peace with him, and I'm going to fix his chariots, and I'm good with that. This is my wife, J.L. She don't care, right? She's good with it, too. So Sisera knows when he's fleeing this battle, and he comes to Heber, the metal worker in J.L.'s tent, Heber's not there. Her husband's conveniently gone. He turns in to her tent, and J.L.'s like, yes, you can come in here. You know, we're at peace with y'all, absolutely. You can come in here. So when he comes in here, let's, let's see. She, he's asking for a drink of water, and he's telling her, if anybody comes into this tent and looking for me, you tell him I'm not in here, right? Because it's a, it's a terrible crime for him to be in a woman's tent anyway, right? So she knew that that's probably inappropriate and all this stuff. So we don't really know what her motive is for letting him in there. We're about to find out. So J.L. lets him in there. Now let's go to verse 21. Remember back in verse 4 it said, Now Deborah, I love how verse 21 says, Then J.L., this is the other bad chick we about to hear about. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple and it went down into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary and he died. What just happened? <laughs> we was just on a battlefield. Now we got some woman in a tent. What What happened? This dude tried to hide and tried to run, and he thought he was running somewhere that was safe. But the Lord had put this unction on Jael. And we don't know why. Was she an Israelite sympathizer? Probably. That's what scholars believe. She did sympathize. as a, There's something in a woman that when you know that this king and this bad guy are raping and murdering Jewish girls, taking them captive, what they were doing was horrible horrific and she knew that that's what would happen if she let him leave that tent that she had the one shot to do what she could do she it was time to shoot her shot and this was all she was going to take care of this and it was this this unction from the Lord Bible scholars believe because she didn't serve the Lord right this isn't Deborah she doesn't have the resume of Deborah do you know who JL is JL is a stay-at-home mama uh, married to an iron worker middle class blue collar that's who J.L. is. J.L. ain't rule, rule, uh, running a nation. J.L. ain't getting downloads from uh, God. J.L. ain't a prophetess. J.L. sitting at home doing the laundry. She cooking dinner. She making sure her man got something to wear to work tomorrow. She making sure her kids got homework done, after school programs done. You know what I'm saying? J.L.'s doing everyday ordinary things. How do we know that? Well, Lisa, she seems pretty unordinary if she's driving tent pegs and hammers into people's heads. In Eastern culture, it was the women's job to work the tent. Every time they, they're nomadic, every time they would pick up a tent and that they would move it, the women did it. Jesus, thank God I ain't living back then. <laughs> I can't even get one of them tents from Kmart to do right. You know what I mean? You're trying to camp with. You imagine a tent you had to live in? Oh, my gosh, that was the women's job. I mean, driving those big ropes and all that, that's what they did. Why do I tell you that? Because a spike and a hammer was an everyday tool for her. She used them every day. It was ordinary. It almost looked insignificant, Kelsey. Where do we see this again in Scripture? A harp and a sling. Use it every day. 
ordinary things, things that you think the Lord ain't got no anointing on, Lee. Things that, you know, you, a washing machine, your minivan, <laughs> right? The things that you use every day in everyday ordinary life that you feel like is mundane, does anybody even see what I'm doing? Does anybody care? Days run into days. Don't they, Mama? Days run into days, and it feels like I just get up tomorrow and we'll do it all over again. And J.L. must have felt that at some point. He goes out to do this. I'm just doing this. And there came a moment where the ordinary in her life changed the course of history. The ordinary in her life changed the course of history. What happens to Sisera in the Bible is known as retributive, retributive, sorry, justice. Because he defiled women, he was killed by a woman. That's the picture that we see here. Remember, evil rulers, enemies of God, are like sin in our lives. And, all like, and like all sin, it's dealt with in one of two places, cross or the hell, or hell, right? We know that. It's either dealt with on the cross or it's dealt with in hell. But sin will be dealt with. We don't get out of that. I know it's Mother's Day. Welcome to Life Point. Uh, <laughs> but sin is still real. And hell is still real. Right? And if this, this passage is teaching us anything, it's that we track down sin. Right? I, I love how um, Charles Spurgeon, uh, one of our great modern scholars, he wrote a sermon where he compared Sisera to sin. And he said that we should not be content to just see our sins flee. You know, see, so just fled from the battlefield. That ain't good enough, y'all. That ain't good enough. He said, you, we should re be ready to pursue them and drive them dead to the ground. Right? Where else do we see that? David not only stunned and with a rock and laid out the giant, but he did what? He cut his head off. Right? You got to finish the job. And J.L. was the girl for it. J.L. was the girl for finishing the job. We are not clear on her motives except that maybe she was an Israelite sympathizer, which we get that. Absolutely. She could have been saying, hey, if they find him in here, this is treasonous. We're at peace with these bad kings. If they find him in here, they're going to kill me too. Maybe she did it because of that. No. We know that there was something on her that would drive her to do that. It could only have been from God. There is a God-ordained moment when J.L. quits being neutral and she takes a stand for the Lord and his people. A God-ordained moment where this ordinary woman doing ordinary things takes a stand for God and his people. She is the only other woman in the Bible called most blessed. Where else do we see that? That's Mary. Mary is called most blessed. J.L. is the only other woman that they, that's, that, that's ever recorded about. It's important to note here that God does not use women in this story because they were not capable men as we're closing. That's not why. It's not that there weren't men there that were capable. Heber was capable of being a good man, right? He was capable of doing what he needed to do. Barak was capable of doing There were men all over that country that were capable. He doesn't use, but Deborah is not a plan B. JL is not a plan B. Why does he use these women? It's not because there was a lack of men. He uses these women because of their gifts and their guts. That's why he uses these women. I want that. Don't you want that? I want that. I want that on my life. I want to know that, it, that I'm not picked out just because I'm a woman and there's not anybody else or that you're a man and there wasn't a woman that could go for you. No, but that there is a gift and there is courage that's on the inside of me and purpose for my life to change the course of history and affect the kingdom of God. And every one of us have that. Amen? As we close, so who's the hero of this story? Who's the hero? Who's the hero? Is it Deborah? Mm -hmm. Is it Barack? Maybe. Is it JL? Well, yeah. Well, that kind of seems like it in the end. No. None of these are the hero in the story. The hero in the story is God. God is the hero of the story. And I'm going to tell you why. This is what I've, I've spent the last few minutes laying this out so that you could get to right here. In the sovereignty of God, he orchestrates this network of these people to accomplish his plan. He wants to use every type of woman, every type of man, 
publicly, privately, prominent businesswoman, stay-at-home mom, someone successful in the boardroom, someone doing really ordinary things. You're just changing diapers. And you think, God, this don't look like kingdom work. This don't look like something that the Lord is proud of. Man, it's no different than when Deborah sat under a palm tree.